And recording is on. All right. To the cloud. All right. Thanks, Kurt. Okay. Welcome, everybody, to our filing claims and appeals webinar. Today is December 29th, 2020. Uh, before we begin, uh, just to quick housekeeping, you may have received an email either last night or today um, with the Zoom information. Um, in that email, there was also uh, links to a couple of attachments that we wanted you to have for the webinar and to take with you after the webinar. Um, that included the PDF link to your veterans resource book. There was also a PDF link for a link map. And then there's also instructions on how to use the chat. Um, besides those items, there was also a few forms in there that uh, George Dixon will talk about later on when he is talking about the uh, CVSOs and the um, filing process. Um, I'll go ahead and give us a quick overview on the CalTAP program. We'll also have one of our links here to talk about how they um, help out veterans here in California. And then at the end, we will have a virtual questions and answers panel where um, all your questions will be answered. Um, if you have any questions for any one of the presenters, please uh, direct them to the Caltech's question um, uh, individual, and we will use those to facilitate the questions and answers portion at the end of the webinar. Those are those uh, instructions for the chat. Um, like I said, you received this in the email. Um, if you're not familiar with Zoom or how to use the chat, take a look at that. Um, and uh, any questions, just direct them to the Caltech's question. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'll do a quick CalTAP overview. My name is Michael Cisneros. I am a training coordinator with the California Department of Veteran Affairs. Um, quick little background on myself. I am a veteran myself. Uh, I separated from the Air Force back in 2007 and went back to school in 2008. Um, I've been working with CalVet since uh, last summer, or actually last October. Um, so, uh, Love working with veterans. I'm glad I'm here and I'm glad I'm a part of this pro this uh, process. So let's go ahead and talk about CalTAP. Uh, so what is CalTAP? Well, CalTAP is a California, it's a transition assistance program that's designed to inform and connect veterans of all eras um, to their state and federal benefits um, as their needs change over time. And so what we've done is we've developed uh, four different pathways that help our veterans navigate those benefits. And those pathways, it's an, our entrepreneurship pathway, we have an employment pathway, an education pathway, and then there's also a general core curriculum of benefits that don't fit into either of those topics that I just mentioned. Um, now we do have a service provider pathway, a fifth pathway. Uh, we don't talk about that much, but if you do have anybody in your community that does wanna work with veterans, um, send them to our website and check out some of the programs that we do have. This is what your veteran resource book looks like. Like I said, you, have a, you had a, PDF um, link in your email to this book. Uh, if this was an in-person web or in-person event, you each would have a resource book sitting in front of you right now. But since we're doing this online, we're just directing people to our website to, to download that PDF copy or check your email. Um, this book is gold for veterans. Everything that we discussed today regarding California benefits for veterans can be found in this book, um, including more. Uh, so if you're curious of what's available to you, um, just open it up and, and take a look. This is what our website looks like at calvet.ca.gov. You can find information about the CalTAP program right there um, at the, by clicking on the CalTAP banner in the middle of the screen. And when you click on that CalTAP banner, you're taken to our Pathways page. Before I move on to the Pathways, I just want to bring your attention down to the bottom, that archive link. Um, since April, we've been doing webinars for our veterans um, and we record them and we post them on our website. So if you click on that archive link, you're taken to um, this page with uh, a list of all the past webinars that we've uh, conducted along with the PDF copy of the PowerPoint. Um, so if you're curious about, you know, webinars on financial literacy, suicide prevention, mental health, um, distance learning, uh, check out what we've already done. Okay, so how do I use CalTAP online? Uh, well, if you go back to our Pathways page, uh, for this example, we'll check out the Core Curriculum Pathway. If you click on that, uh, you're taken to a Modules page, and uh, each pathway has 
um, a few different modules uh, contained inside. Uh, for the core curriculum pathway, we're looking at modules that revolve around healthcare, VA healthcare in particular. Um, I believe there's one about financial literacy down at the bottom, claims and compensation. Um, but module number five is gonna be all about your California benefits. So if you click on that, um, you can find out information. Um, on There's a PDF that you can download, which looks like this. Um, as you can see, this one's talking about your the California tuition and fee waiver for veterans dependents. Um, and then you could also find this information out um, in your book. So what are those benefits? Uh, so yeah, these are the PDF and the, and the book that I just mentioned. Um, the PDF and the book uh, actually break down the information uh, better than what you would find on the website. So I would definitely recommend either checking out that resource book um, which will break down where how to start the process, uh, where to turn in information and, and eligibility requirements, or check out this PDF right here. So one of the first uh, benefits that we like to talk about is the college tuition and fee waiver for our veteran, our dependents of veterans. Um, this is a popular benefit, uh, and it waives the tuition and fees for uh, any state-funded school. So that's any UC, CSU, or California Community College. Um, with this benefit, the veteran does have to have a disability rating. However, that disability rating falls between zero and 100. Um, and so uh, we see a lot of veterans uh, taking advantage of, of this particular uh, plan. Um, and when I say plan, I mean uh, plan B. So with this tuition and fee waiver, there are four different plans, plan A, plan B, plan C, and plan D. Um, with, the, with the zero to 100 rating, that's plan B. Um, they are going to look at your dependents income level um, just to make sure that it's uh, it's not uh, above the poverty line. Um, but if that's not the case, then um, this benefit is there for the veteran to use whenever they like. Um, there's no expiration date on it. We've also partnered with the DMV to make it easier for individuals to identify as a veteran. Um, and so we have the drivers, the veterans driver's license program where somebody could get the word veteran printed on their driver's license. And this just makes it so that you don't have to walk around with um, sensitive information in your back pocket, like a DD form 214, which has your social security number on it. Uh, there's also the honoring veterans license plate program. Uh, this program is available to anybody in California. You don't have to have a veteran status. Um, all proceeds for this program actually go towards veteran services here in California. So this is what helps, uh, helps fund your local county veteran service office. Uh, and then there's also the motor vehicle registration fee waiver. Um, I won't talk too much about this, but uh, it is available to those individuals with a disability rating. If you're interested in this, I would definitely recommend speaking with your local county veteran service office and they could talk to you more about the eligibility requirements. <clears throat> All right, for those of you who like to be outdoors, we have a fishing and hunting license uh, that's offered at a reduced cost. Um, I believe with this one, you do have to have a honorable discharge and be at least 50% disabled, rated 50% disabled or more. Um, and there's also the state park pass. Uh, state park pass where you're, you're able to enter into any state park uh, within the country now um, at no cost. Uh, the same thing with this one, you do have to have an honorable discharge and uh, be rated at least 50% or more uh, with your disability. Tax programs. Uh, we don't talk too much about tax programs because it is different uh, across California, but there are programs out there for individuals with disabilities, um, individuals who want to open up their own veteran-owned business. Um, what I would do is speak with your local tax assessor to figure out what the eligibility requirements are for these programs if this is something that you're interested in. All right, so our CalVet home loans, this is uh, different than the federal VA home loan program. Our CalVet home loans program provides financing for veterans, um, competitive market interest rates, and no or low down payment requirements. Um, we have somebody who usually speaks about the home loans program um, with us on, on these events, um, but he's not here today, or Brad Pedersen, we call him the, the home loans guru. Uh, but we could go ahead and put his his uh, contact information in the chat. So that way, uh, if any of you out there are in the market, feel free to give him a call. He could talk to you more about this program. He loves helping out veterans. 
All right, for our women veterans, we have a program that offers information, advocacy, outreach, and support. Um, there's also a roster that you can um, sign up on so that you can continue getting updates on pre or um, future webinars or outreach events. This is our webpage. Um, if you go to the CalVets website, you can find the Women Veterans webpage um, there in the middle of the screen, uh, the, or at least the banner for the webpage in the middle of the screen. Um, and then the email address is right there where you can, and that's where you can sign up for that roster. For our, our minority vets, uh, we also have a program that provides information, advocacy, outreach, and support. And this program also helps with, um, also helps unnaturalized veterans with their citizenship and naturalization services. And their webpage can be found on the minority and underrepresented veterans uh, webpage. <clears throat> All right, uh, homes for long-term care. So some of you guys might not be thinking about this right now, uh, but if you, know somebody in your community or have a family member that's a veteran and is looking for um, homes for long-term care. Uh, we have eight here in California, all the way down in Chula Vista to Reading up north. Um, these homes offer medical, dental, pharmacy, rehabilitation, and also social activities. State cemeteries, again, this is a, probably a benefit you're not thinking about right now, but if you have a family member or somebody in your community who, do, who does need um, burial services. There are three different veteran cemeteries here in California. Uh, there's one in Seaside, California, which is right outside of Monterey. There's another one in Redding, and then the one in Yonville, which is right outside of Napa. Now, the Yonville Veterans Home Cemetery, it, you do have to be a resident of the veterans home to be buried there. Um, so if that's not the case, you do have those other two options. And I believe there is a fourth one that they're in the works right now for uh, down in Southern California. Okay, so before I go, um, I just want to bring your attention to a couple common web, uh, veteran websites that you should be familiar with um, uh, here in California, especially if you are utilizing uh, VA benefits. So the first one is va.gov. I consider this kind of like a hub for veterans. Um, so if you're interested in healthcare, disability, uh, education, or, or checking out your records, um, this website will direct you to the websites you need to go to to get those processes started. There's also eBenefits. Um, for those of you who are actually taking advantage of benefits, um, you can come here to see what's going on with those, uh, with the processes for those. Um, for example, when I was in school, I was checking up on this website continuously just to see if, uh, you know, my BAH was still going through, if they certified my classes, um, did they send out a check already? Um, so this is where you can find that information. And then finally, there's My Healthy Vet. This is a pretty cool website for those of you who are taking advantage of the VA healthcare system. We have um, a website where you could actually check out your medical records. You could communicate with your primary care physician, set up appointments with them, and then also refill prescriptions. So that's just a quick overview of the CalTAP program and some of the benefits that are available to you. Um, like I said, there's a ton out there, um, and I would definitely recommend looking in that resource book or checking out our website to figure out what is available to you and what are the uh, requirements for those benefits. If you have any questions about what I went over today, um, feel free to reach out to me. through my, That's my email right there, um, or give the 1-800 number a call, and we could direct you to anybody that can answer your questions. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on now to Kevin Graves. Kevin is our local interagency network coordinator, um, and he's going to explain the roles and responsibilities for links here in California. So go ahead, Kevin. Thank you, Michael. Good morning, everybody. Great to see a great crowd with us this morning. Can I get the next slide, please? So there are eight of us local interagency network coordinators or links in uh, California serving uh, the veterans of California. Uh, it, we're divided into regions, sometimes by geographic, sometimes by population. But this map will show you where we're located and also give you contact information for us. Although we tend to know the resources and benefits that are available within our own region better than other regions, you can reach out to any of us. But again, if you're looking for specific resources and benefits, uh, reaching out to a link that's in your region or the region you're looking for uh, would be beneficial. Um, we uh, Next slide, please. 
So our primary mission is to serve the veterans and their families uh, of the state of California. We do that in a lot of different ways. Uh, one of the ways we do that is by making referrals uh, to service providers uh, in our area, uh, whether they be nonprofit, for-profit, governmental, non-governmental agencies. Uh, we connect with them and we try to connect veterans with them. We assist with local emergencies. For example, the fires. Um, we are always at the uh, local assistance centers providing benefits and resources for veterans who might have lost something during the fire, might have lost their home, might have lost their DD-214, might have lost their hearing aids, whatever it is, we try to get them uh, immediately under emergency circumstances hooked up with those resources that they may have uh, been separated from. And then we provide leadership within the local community also. We try to work with community leaders, business leaders, helping them to understand the benefits of working with and appreciating everything that goes along with hiring and being associated with veterans. Next slide. Within, within the state, we, we, we partner with a lot of our sister agencies. Um, for our state benefits, uh, we, we partner with our county veteran service offices. Uh, there's 58, 56 out of 58 counties in the state of California have a county veteran service office. You are going to hear from one of those subject matter experts a great guy. I can't wait to hear his presentation again uh, here coming up pretty soon. But we work side by side with them because they process a lot of the benefits and, and opportunities, uh, paperwork that you heard Michael talk about. A lot of that gets presented at the County Veteran Service Office. And also, and while you're there, we can talk to you about what, what this webinar is about, and that is filing claims, um, up, uh, discharge upgrades, all that kind of thing. And um, we also, for our employment side, we partner heavily with, our, with the EDD. Um, uh, they have dedicated individuals within the EDD that work strictly for veterans. And also they work to find employers that wanna hire veterans and then try to put those two together. Um, they are challenged with the, with the COVID as we all are today, but I think the EDD might've been hit harder just because of the unemployment claim situation but they're still there to serve you guys. It may take a little patience to get through to them, but they're, they do a good job and they have tremendous resources. We also partner with our federal partners. We partner with the VA, um, vet centers, CBOX, um, and we work closely um, uh, with them in, in different ways to make sure that they're able to reach out to you and that you're able to get the benefits uh, that, that you've earned uh, from them. Can I get the next slide, please? So some of the things that we get asked a lot, understanding the difference between federal and state benefits, we're, we get a lot of phone calls that people in, in immediately assume that uh, because we have veterans in, uh, administration behind our name, or <laughs> veterans affairs behind our name, that we are the federal VA and we're not. But again, we can help you connect with them. We have numbers that we can help get to you. So we help you understand the difference between what benefits come from the state and what benefits you earned while you served the federal government. Uh, we work with uh, th these pillars of housing, healthcare, mental health, employment, and educational resources. Those are all benefits that the state has its fingers in and we can help, uh, we can help provide for you. Uh, as Michael talked about the CalVet home loan program and how that differs from the federal VA home loan program. Um, also, we, uh, we, we work with um, are the, closely with the community colleges to make sure that they have the information they need and can share with you with regards to their vet centers, um, hopefully getting you the educational benefits that you need and through completion. So when, you're, when you've used your benefits, you have a degree at the end and that's really the important thing. Also the benefits available through CalVet and, um, and again, whatever local or regional resources that we can provide. Next slide, please. All right, well, that is my contact information, my name. Um, I am going to give you one other phone number, which isn't on there, which I will change, but it's 925-817-7370. You guys can throw that in the chat for me. And that is my, that's my cell number. So if you are looking to, or if you hit a brick wall, or you just need some assistance or some understanding, feel free to call me. I'll do what I can to help you find whatever it is you're looking for, or at least guide you in the right direction. And with that, I will pass this back to Michael. 
Kevin, Kevin, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you please repeat your phone number so I can add it one more time in the chat, please? 925-817-925-817-7370. Thank you, sir. Thank you, guys. And I'm uh, looking forward to hearing from George. Oh, all right. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate that. Uh, now I'm going to pass it on to George. George Dixon is from the L.A. County Veterans Service Office. And he's going to explain how they assist veterans during the uh, claims and appeal process. Uh, so go ahead, George. All right. Good morning, everybody. And um, welcome to what are we in about month nine and COVID lockdown. Um, kind of like sitting in the middle of a bunker somewhere in Germany or um, Panama or wherever you served at. And you're sitting there thinking about, man, I got to get out of here. Um, there may be some highs and lows. So confide in each other. And I'd highly advise you, if you know a veteran that's sitting in that situation, um, give him or her a call to um, show some appreciation for service and comfort them. Because there's a lot of veterans that are going through some depressed states right now and need other brothers and sisters, veterans and the veterans community to talk to them. So before I get started in my presentation and I can look at the numbers, I see there's about 130 of you in here. And um, Calvec can tell me how many Army veterans and you guys can use the little... Uh, uh, apparatus there, the restrictions with the thumbs up or the clapping of the hands. How many Army veterans do I have out there right now? And just hit the thumbs up to your right and, and I can see them pop up on the side. And then the next group is Marines and Navy, Air Force, Coast Guardsmen. And I don't think we have any Space Force yet. So uh, that's going to be interesting. And then also look at um, how many of you are former Army National Guard or Reservists or Air National Guard or um, Navy reservists or any form of reserve service and didn't serve on active duty, but did serve in the reserves. And then the next group of people we want to talk to is how many spouses out there sitting in listening in for their significant other because the the veteran won't speak up. So um, show show a clap of hands or a thumbs up with those individuals that are out there in the community. It's very important that you use the resources given to you, either the CalVet resource book, your county veteran service officer, the links, the Department of Veterans Affairs, the Disabled American Veterans, Veterans of Foreign Wars, AMVEST, or any of those organizations that support veterans. My name is George Dixon. I'm the supervisor of Veterans Claims, Los Angeles County, former director of Veteran Services, Monterey County, former supervisor of LA uh, Veteran Services, LA County, a uh, senior vet rep, a lowly vet rep, and then I worked for the DAV approximately five years before I went to the county. So a uh, wide um, knowledge and experience of working with veterans from all eras, but we're all in this together. All of us chose to raise our hands and serve, and some of you volunteered by the U.S. government to serve against your will. So next slide. So purpose of my presentation is to give you a basic understanding of benefits, um, develop an understanding of familiarization of what the advocates do for you and understand how your county veteran service officer assists you in your community. Like the previous speaker stated, there's 58 counties and 56 of them have county veteran service officers. And when I was up in Monterey County, we partnered with San Benito County. So Monterey County actually assists San Benito County also. And at the very end, answer some of your questions. And if they get too hypothetical, I can actually schedule you up for an appointment, but I would actually advise you to seek out your county veteran service officer to work your cases. Next slide. So who are the county veteran service officers in your, command, your community? They're advisors to your board of supervisors. They're advisors to senators, congressmen and women, uh, assembly persons, and local officials. They advise veterans, dependents, and their survivors on benefits, and they advocate on your behalf. They advise veteran service organizations and participate in veteran service organizations meetings and planning for events. They are advisors and work closely with the Department of Veterans Affairs, California Department of Veterans Affairs, and other organizations that support veterans' issues in your community. Um, if you haven't done so, I would connect up with your county veteran service officer to see if they would participate at your local VFW, American Legion, AMVET, Disabled American Veterans Post in support of veterans events, either virtually online or in person when we break out of this COVID environment. Next slide. So 
who we are continue. What do we do? Your county veteran service officers are dedicated to provide excellent professional service to their customers, both external and, and internal. That includes not only county departments, but external customers such as your veterans organizations, nonprofits and organizations that they connect with to work veterans issues. They advocate on your behalf. They're the voice of those who cannot speak for themselves. Um, they also help on military installations with CalTAPs and TAPS classes. I know here in LA County, I um, have my staff go up to Edwards Air Force Base, even though it's Kern County, we partner up with the CVSO up there and we also frequent LA Air Force Base. We also frequent the large reserve and National Guard centers. And we had the opportunity to do a virtual presentation during COVID with a unit that was demobilizing with CalVid. And it was thrown together like in five minutes, I got a call from uh, one of the first sergeants at one of the guard units that were demobilizing. And we threw it together pretty quick and the soldiers got a lot of good information and were able to file their benefits applications at that time. They're devoted to taking care of those who served and who are still serving and were defenders of your rights for benefits that you earn. So keep in mind when you're working a claim, um, my experience is we always hear, I like to refer to this as the, uh, the back in the day, the barracks lawyers where everybody say, hey, do this, do that, do that. And if you don't go to somebody who's in the practice of providing benefits or securing your benefits or is credentialed by the Department of Veterans Affairs, you have to be very careful because you may stand a chance of reduction of benefits. Um, keep in mind, there's, I look at it as there's a set pro process of doing claims and benefits but claims and benefits is very opinionated. And um, as you look at it, and I look at a certain situation that may have been denied in the past and we're able to develop it and it's successful um, at the end, it's just getting a different set of eyes to look at your case. Uh, case in point, there was one young lady out here who appealed her decision and she received close to half a million dollars and she continuously pursued her claim and the VA found that there was an error with our help and advocates and advocating on her behalf, she won her claim. But she was gonna give up. She went to a lawyer, um, a lawyer put documents through, wanted to charge her 20% of what revenue she generated for free. And that's another point. You have to be very careful because people will charge you money when you're doing these claims. Your county veteran service officer, Cal Vets, DAV, VFW, AMVETS, do all this for you for free. And you know, take and point, they're the subject matter experts in claims work. Sometimes veterans don't like hearing what county veteran service officers or organizations have to tell them. But keep in mind, a lot of the veterans organizations have been in practice for years and everybody's entitled to representation and advocacy. And you can change representation and advocacy at any time too. But you know, don't always go with the barracks lawyers on the left or right, because they're not always right. And sometimes we're not always right, but sit down and counsel and see what the best course of action is for you because your organizations are there to secure the highest entitlement or benefits that you're entitled to. Next slide. So who do we serve? There are four main populations that we serve. We serve veterans, which all of you, probably the bulk of you are all veterans. We serve your family members. We serve National Guard and Reserve members. We serve survivors and dependents of veterans. Um, everybody is entitled to at least, and we're always advised, tell the veteran file the claim. Um, a lot of veterans go, well, let me, let me think about doing this and I'm going to wait a year. I, I had them send out a VA form 210966 for those of you that are thinking about filing a claim. I would highly advise you to clip, uh, complete that intent to file form and get it in before the end of the month. If you're thinking about filing a claim and don't have all the evidence to put it under the fully developed claims process or if you want it to go under the standard process, at least get the 210966 in today to your county veteran service officer or to the VA so that you can protect your pay date. If you wait until after the first, you're gonna lose one month of benefits. And that's what the 210966 is there for, for, for you guys. Um, there's also a VA form 21-22, and that's so that you can appoint representation for your claims work. Um, that's for CalVet, and then you can get that over to your county veteran service officer. So they can represent you in case you want to appeal the decisions that you get back from the VA. Next slide. So remember, I put money dollar signs up there. Veterans benefits get you compensation. Some common, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some common factors 
who qualifies for VA benefits and VA benefits in general. Remember, it's not gonna make you the subject matter expert with this 30 minute session to 45 minute session, but it's gonna give you a basic overview. And it's gonna give you a place to go to seek out information on benefits and at least pursue your claims or benefits that you earn for your service. Next slide. So some common factors that affect you and your benefits. Um, County Veterans Service Officer and VA looks at your length of service. For service connection, one day of active duty, an example I like using is say, for those of you that volunteered against your will that were drafted and the drill sergeant kind of tortured you and told, crammed you into a cattle car at Fort Benning or um, Camp Pendleton or wherever you took your basic training at and put 100 of you into the cattle car and there was only supposed to be 20 of you in the cattle car, or or actually 38, I was a former drill sergeant. So we were, we were only allowed to put 38 people with equipment in the cattle car. But I took basic training um, at, at, or OSIT training at Fort Benning, Georgia, and they would cram about 80 or 90 of us in the cattle car. And then you were forced out of the cattle car and you got trampled. And there's probably two of you that are sitting out in this audience right now that were one of those service members that got trampled by your peers because they were rushed out and injured your leg or something. So that injury would probably be incurred in service. And you probably forgot about that because you didn't want to go on sick call because you were too afraid of the drill sergeant. So um, wartime and peacetime, when your veteran service officer looks at your claims work, they're going to look at uh, periods of service that you served. Right now, we're still in war because the Gulf War never ended, and it's still continuing on. So when veterans come into our office, they're considered wartime veterans. And you know you have Vietnam, Korea. Um, there may be still a couple of World War II veterans out there that need help. So we're going to look at the periods of service that you served. And um, generally, for pension purposes, because it does require wartime service. Income levels for pension service, for wartime service, and the pension is a benefit based on the need of the veteran who has no or limited income and it provides them with a wartime pension. Um, we do work with character of discharge upgrades other than dishonorable discharges. We also work to get you benefits for VA purposes or medical care. Talk to your county veteran service officer about trying to at least get a chapter 17 benefit for healthcare. If you know of service members that are out there saying, well, you know, I got an OTH, I'm not entitled to anything. I would highly encourage you to get them into the County Veteran Service Office or your Veteran Service Organization to talk about the character of discharge upgrade, or at least to let the VA make the determination if they are eligible for care. And then sometimes they will give them compensation if the VA deems it honorable for VA purposes. Service-connected disability, there are some principles to get service-connected. So while you're sitting back in your chair, think back if you ever went on sick call. And the obvious one I like to tell veterans about is Nine times out of 10, the bulk of you, I'd say about 95% of you sitting on this call right now have a high frequency hearing loss or your ears are constantly ringing. That's not because your buddy's talking about you. It's because you po probably fired a weapon system without hearing protection and the ears ring all the time and you forgot about that. And you're, or you went to combat and you were too gun ho and said, you know what? I'm not going to say anything. My ears ring and I can't hear a darn thing. And you're walking around with two hearing aids. So, and your wife, or your significant others going, hey, you know, I, you're not paying attention to me. So I don't know if some of you are turning the hearing aid down or, you know, it's honest, honest to God truth where you can't hear what they're telling you because it's a high frequency noise. So that would be consisted as a direct service connection because you didn't have it before you went in and you had it when you, when, um, you joined the military or actually a little bit of time in the military and it was incurred as a result of your service. Um, so veterans forget about that. So Look at the age for veterans and age 65 or older, especially if they have limited or low income. Some of you may have some family members in that situation or you're spending a lot of money to um, take care of them and their nest egg is depleting. So talk to your veteran service officer about a special monthly pension that they may be entitled to. Next slide. So County Veteran Service Officer, helps you with disability compensation. And there are some principles. The first one we talked about in the previous slide is direct service connection. Look at it this way. When you go in the military, um, the, the doc looked at you, or uh, if you served during the Vietnam era, Korean War era, some of you, um, so I'm gonna look at a show of hands. How many of you were volunteered against your will or were drafted into the armed forces? So I just wanna see how many raised their hands. Or you got a little letter in the mail saying you will report to this duty station. 
So there may be one or two of them out there, or you may know of some veterans. So back in the day, they would look at you and say, okay, two ears, two eyes, two hands, two feet. Okay, go like this, infantry. So they, they signed them up and they really had no choice. And some of the veterans I talked to, they said that they would line them up and they would go Army, Marine, or Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, Marine. And then they would sort them all out that way and they put them where they needed to have them. So back in the day when there's a little bit of difference when you were drafted, you were volunteered and they put you in the military organ organization that they, at, that they needed you in. Um, Everybody that joined the armed forces, you're presumed fit for duty, or there is a presumption of soundness as long as there is no known defects on your entrance examination. So if you went in the military and you ended up with that bad hearing loss, or you were running PT in boots prior to 1981, and you popped your knee out and the drill sergeant or your sergeant said, or your chief said, don't say nothing about that knee, keep on running there, a soldier, Marine or sailor or airman. And you kept on running on it and running on it and all they gave you was Moultrin. So you look at it like, well, I went in the military and it didn't happen to me when I, before I went in the military. So it became onset as a direct result of my service. The injury was incurred in service. So I'm gonna throw this question out there to you, some of you guys. How many of you sitting in the audience went to a recruiter and the recruiter said, hey man, don't say nothing about that bad knee and I'll get you in or some sort of defect you had like asthma or bronchitis or some other disease process that the recruiter said, don't say anything, I'll get you in. So if there's one person sitting out there and that recruiter said, don't say anything about that bad sports injury you had and they get you in and then you decide to join the infantry and your knee pops out of place because the recruiter said, hey, don't say nothing about that bad knee, but somehow or another, the doc seen that surgical scar you had on your knee when you went in and all of a sudden the military tried to fix that knee, the VA will look at it as aggravation beyond natural progression. So you may file a claim on that knee. The other part that we'll look at is some secondary issues. So I like to use the knee as an example. So you get service connected for the left knee that was injured in service. And all of a sudden, as you get older and it generally works in a U, um, your left hip, your low back, your opposite hip, and your opposite knee start giving you problems. So we would look at it as a secondary condition um, as a result of the first condition that onset in service. So some of you may be sitting out there with a 10% uh, a knee condition and you're walking kind of awkward and you have a cane and you never talk to anybody about increasing that knee, or you may have service connected the knee and had a total knee replacement and forgot about increasing that knee. And the VA gave you a temporary 100% for about 13 months, and then they reduced it down to 30% because they said you still have good range of motion in that knee. And now your hip and your back and your opposite hip are giving you problems, and your opposite knee are giving you problems. And you develop some anxiety because of the chronic pain. So these are things that your county veteran service officer can talk to you about and get you to file. Um, VA helps you with um, vocation rehabilitation. They did change the, um, the name of voc rehab. Um, but we do help you get into school if you need to um, get some retraining. And generally, when you get your first rating of 10% or higher, you can apply for rehabilitation training through the Department of Veterans Affairs. But keep in mind that 10% must uh, have an employment handicap, but you are entitled to apply for benefits. We help facilitate the application to get your certificate of eligibility for your home loan, your Chapter 33, any old Chapter 30 benefits. Uh, County Veterans Service Officer helps you pursue enrollment in VA healthcare. And it's very important that you join VA healthcare because um, if we don't use the system, then you know the government, they try to cut back and they try to reduce things and they try to privatize it. So I would highly encourage you stand up and be counted, get a 1010 easy form, take it over to the VA and enroll. They're going to stick you in one of eight priority groups and you know just be stand up and be accounted for, help your fellow veterans out. So at times when something happens to the veteran, if we pass away, I'm, I'm one for it. I don't keep my stuff in order. I might have my DD-214 somewhere. And you hear the spouses say, well, what happens when you pass away? And veterans will tell the wives or husbands or partners, and they'll say, hey, uh, all the paperwork's in the drawer. So when the veteran passes away, the, the family members are looking for documents, and the veteran doesn't keep things in order. 
So it's very important because your spouse or partner or significant other may be entitled to a widow's pension or dependency indemnity compensation as a result of something causing you to pass as a result of your military service. Um, dependent survivors benefits such as dependency indemnity compensation, life insurance, and at the end we do assist with burial. County veteran service officers are really good at helping you get honors for the loved ones that have passed away. Um, it's sad over the holidays I dealt with about six in one shot and it's a little bit difficult setting up honors during COVID because some organizations won't go out there but keep in mind, some of your veterans organizations do have honor guards, such as your American Legion and VFW have an all veterans honor guard. And your county veteran service officers are well connected with those individuals. Next slide. So depending on what resource you have, and I have the last one. And on page 32, it gives you an overview of disability compensation in your veterans resource book. We talked a little bit about it. We help you secure your benefits we advocate for you on your behalf in the event that they, you get disallowed your benefit or a lot of veterans will get, okay, they have seven issues and they'll get multiple zeros or the VA will acknowledge the injury and then they come out with 10% and the veteran becomes very frustrated. Why am I only 10%? So that's why it's very important to take that decision to a County Veteran Service Officer or CalVet or a Veteran Service Organization that understands the process and how to help you navigate the complex system of the VA. Next slide. So we know that compensation is a monetary benefit that's non-taxable. So um, before I go on, how many military retirees do I have in the audience? Are there any military retirees out there? I'll give you about a one minute to respond in the queue. So give me a thumbs up. So we have two, three retirees, four, five, six, seven. I'm retired to you guys. And I still think I'm in the army. That's why I'm wearing a Fort Hunter legged short. Seven. So I see a total of about, looks like eight or nine. There is a unique benefit for military retirees. So some of you are probably getting concurrent receipt if you're rated at 50% or higher, but there is a benefit called combat related special monthly compensation that makes your military retirement non-taxable. So I would definitely advise you to go talk to your County Veteran Service Officer about CRSC. Uh, remember, CRSC is for combat related injuries, but there is a stipulation in there that talks about um, training exercises simulating combat. So are there any old former Fort Ord alumni that were in light infantry such as myself that walked back from Hunter Liggett 102 miles and had to walk across Panama and damage your neck and shoulders because we had Gerald Harkins, who was a Colonel and survival, survivor of Hamburger Hill, who said, we can do it in three days. So it really tore us up. So that was situation simulating combat. But um, you know, a lot of people that were in combat arms or sailors, airmen and Marines, um, everybody's job is infantry served and had to walk with everybody else and injured themselves. So if you're a military retiree and you have injuries as a result of combat, obvious one is probably post-traumatic stress disorder um, or you were in FTX and you were injured yourself and had one individual that was in Korea on the demilitarization zone and he fell in a trench and busted his knee um, and had some other injuries. So he retired and we put in for those injuries and they offset his retirement and made it non-taxable. So these are benefits that retirees are entitled to along with the compensation. Some retirees will sit there and go, well, I'm just getting my retirement pay and they never apply for VA compensation. So it's very important. It's non-taxable. So typical beneficiary for disability compensation is a service member or the veteran who became physically injured during his or her service. Psychological issues related to service. So you can have a physical disability, psychological disability, or disease process, um, some dis or a presumptive condition. So some presumptive conditions, um, how many go for one veterans and current conflict veterans are out there? So raise your hand. Serving in Iraq, not Afghanistan. There's six. Seven, eight. So I have 10 participants, or actually, well, 10 participants have served in Iraq. So the next question I'm going to ask the 10 participants is how many of you had the Persian Gulf War protocol examination done at the VA to you? So let me see how many. So 
I see nine. That's good. So what I, what I want you guys to do is pass the word to your peers. It's very important to have that protocol exam done to you. If you want to research what possibly could be wrong with you, look up CFR 3.317, and there's a fact sheet, and it's very important. Your county veteran service officer can help you file for these issues. Uh, so a lot of veterans, well, I had the exam, and but I don't understand why my joints pop or my shoulders hurt and my chest hurts all the time and the VA can't diagnose me with anything. And now my PTSD is getting worse and I don't know what the heck's going on with me. Get in to talk to somebody, very important. Uh, how many of you served are on the Afghanistan and Iraq veterans and first Gulf four? How many of you did the um, burn pit registry for environmental hazards? So I have 10, that's good, 11. And some of you probably did that prior to getting off of active duty and went in line and did it. So you want to you want to keep on um, you know stand up on that registry and look look into it because there may be some conditions coming out. Um, if you have chronic bronchitis or some other odd things coming up, um, worry about cancers that are developed. So you know that's very important. So keep this in mind. Um, the service connected disability compensation is tax free, but if you get a zero percent, my first rating was a scar. On this side, that's Jeez. zero. Um, they talked oh, about man. the college tuition fee waiver. So how many of you would like your kids to go to college for free? You're six. All you need is that little scar. Talk to your county veteran service officer. And right now, it, the, the income threshold is about 11300 bucks for the child, not the veteran. Veterans always come into us and go, oh, well, well, I made notes for the child, not the veteran, okay? So the County Veteran Service Officer is their approving authority for that, um, that benefit, the college tuition fee waiver. Next slide. So eligibility requirements for service-connected disability um, prior to September 1980, there's no time period. After September 1980, some benefits require 24 months of active duty. But for service connection, the example I gave is getting trampled by the cattle, cattle car. I think I, the least amount of time I worked on one person was like two weeks and something, something happened to him. He's running down the stairs and he fell down the stairs in the barracks and fractured his wrist. So they put him in a cast and put him out within two weeks. So he got service connected for the wrist fracture. Other than honorable discharge, uh, we will work with them. So we talked a little bit about presumptive disabilities. Are, are there any Vietnam veterans out there right now who served in Vietnam or blue water sailors? I got a couple of you guys. Very important. How, now, with Vietnam veterans, how many of you had the Agent Orange protocol exam and went to the VA to determine if you had any issues related to Agent Orange? If you haven't done so, I would highly advise seek out the VA healthcare system and have get the Agent Orange protocol exam done to you. So the most obvious ones that we see in Vietnam veterans, diabetes type two, ischemic heart disease. And, and with diabetes, we end up with the peripheral neuropathy. Um, hypertension is linked to that and some other issues. Lost use of creative organ, erectile dysfunction. So you really wanna get in and get that exam done to you talk to the county veteran service rep or somebody who's credentialed to do the claims work. Um, some factors that the benefit amount that pays, if you look in your benefits book, it will tell you a little bit about degree of disability. So 10% um, pays a set amount and you can go from zero to hundred. You get additional compensation for your dependents if you're rated 30% or higher. And believe it or not, I come across veterans that have been rated 30% 30, 30 for years and they've been married for 20 or 30 years and they've never added their spouse on there. And first question we always look at, well, you're 30%, how come you're being paid as a single veteran? And I'll have the spouse sitting there, well, he's been married for 30 years. And, and um, while well, you're supposed to be getting a little extra money for your, your spouse and your children. So keep that in mind. A um, little bit about loss of use of, the loss of use of extremity or creative organ. The VA does pay extra monetary benefit for the loss of use of a hand or foot or creative organ. And you'll see this in what they call special monthly compensation awards. A little bit more complex to talk about them, but they, it's slightly over $100 for 
or lost the use of a hand or foot or a creative organ. So you can't get additional compensation if you lose these extremities. Oh shit. Uh-oh. Like this. So the other thing too is under presumptive disabilities, there are some veterans that come down with diseases such as multiple sclerosis. There is a seven year presumptive period. So if you come down with a diagnosis, there was one individual that I worked with that had the symptomology within the seven years. It, it took us a while to argue the case and he had to go to a neurologist and specialty doctors to make the determination that he did have multiple sclerosis within the seven year presumptive period and the benefit was granted. <clears throat> the sad thing about it is it took a while to argue it to the board and um, the veteran passed two years after he got his rating. But it was a pretty hefty sum that he received. And he came into my office and he said, George, nobody cared about me when um, I was sick. So I'm going to donate it to the whales. Sure enough, when he passed away, he donated his proceeds, the bulk of it, to the whales. Um, I think it was the orcas. He, he was very big with that. So individual unemployability, if you have a veteran, and it could be anybody that you know that can't obtain or maintain substantial gainful employment, he or she may be entitled to individual unemployability if they have one disability rated at 40 with others combined to 70% or one disability in itself rated by the Department of Veterans Affairs at 60% being a factor of him or her not being able to obtain or maintain substantial gainful employment. Um, one I like to use for the 60 is like a back issue and they're kind of sloped over and they're always in chronic pain. What that too is the county veteran service officer would probably increase, try to increase the, dis, uh, not increase the disability, but add some other issues such as anxiety or depression because you know the person is always in chronic pain. Um, but they may be entitled to the unemployability, which pays the 100% rate to that veteran. So keep that in mind as you're talking to veterans. If you see a homeless veteran out there, you'll see a lot of them out there, well, I'm rated 70% and I still wanna be outside. So, hey man, why don't you come in and let me help you. Mentor somebody into the County Veteran Service Office, maybe you can get that individual higher rating, possibly get him or her some housing too. Um, and I know some of you out there do know people. Next slide. So when you come into anybody's office and we're, we're sitting in the COVID environment now, so LA County has the opportunity to have stuff sent to them. We drop it into the VA file. We actually can work with you through Teams. A lot of your county veteran service officers are doing that too. Um, and I know CalVet gave the toll free number to um, county veteran service officers across the county, but engage. When you come in, they're gonna look for your DD-214 or discharge document if you have it. Um, make sure you bring in current treatment records. If, if you strictly use the VA for your healthcare, it's a lot easier because your county veteran service officer just has to put your receiving treatment at um, Palo Alto VA, West LA VA, Loma Linda VA, Fresno VA, Bakersfield VA. Because the VA, once they go after your file, they're gonna go after their own internal records. Where we make the mistake at in veterans and themselves is they forget to tell the vet rep, hey, I've been to 15 other doctors over the years and they don't gather that evidence. And in COVID, it's a little bit difficult to get the evidence, but if you can, that's why you have the 210966 that protects you to gather the evidence for your claim to substantiate it. Now for increased evaluation, if you complete the 21526EZ that was attached to you, um, you can put in for an increased evaluation. Keep in mind that, yeah, you don't have to have a lot of uh, medical treatment for that. And they're gonna send you out to the doctor to reevaluate your condition, but it always helps to have some sort of treatment on that condition to give that comp and pen examiner some um, options to look at where you can weigh the evidence because um, a lot of you probably put in for an increase and you got the decision back saying it's still the same. And a lot of veterans are like, well, you know, I can do the increase. And because we're, we are authorized to the increased evaluation without going to 20 or 30 doctors because you're just looking at an increase. And, um, but we always advise, talk to your other doctor, your primary care, it always helps. So they have some basis or foundation to look at to, to see if it warrants an increase. Um, especially when you're dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder or like a physical disability. So veterans will say, I wanna increase my PTSD and they haven't seen a psychiatrist in 10 years. Um, and we caution them, it's your call to try and do the increase, but you may stand the chance of a reduction 
if you go out to that competent examiner and he or she says, hey, so what are you doing for treatment? And you'll say, and you say, oh, nothing. I'm not taking any medication. And all of a sudden that competent examiner will say, oh, I think he's got better. So then you come back to the vet rep and say, well, why did you put me in for the increase? And the vet reps are trained to advise you, hey, are you seeing the doc? You know, what are you doing? We want to build a, a good foundation. So when you look at your claims work, you know, especially if it's an original claim, you're looking at a in-service occurrence for the, the injury, the link between your service or a nexus, a nexus that nexus to your service and current treatment. So if the VA says, well, what are you doing? Well, you got out 20 years ago and you're trying to do this claim. What have you been doing for 20 years to treat this condition? And a lot of veterans say, well, nothing. I just, I just thought this condition was in service. I'm going to put in for it. So there's no nexus or link from service to connect that claim. And that's what they're going to look at. Um, if you're married, bring the dependency records. Um, another thing too, is if you're divorced, uh, the most I've, I've seen one veteran divorce seven times. So we had to track all that down and he kept on getting remarried and, and the VA couldn't keep up with him. Bring in marriage certificates, divorce de uh, certificates or divorce decrees. Your direct deposit info is important. A lot of veterans will go on to e-benefits and put in their direct deposit info. Um, talk to somebody who's credentialed to do the work. Your buddies are sometimes okay, but um, talk to somebody who does the work. You know That way you can get another opinion. And there's multiple organizations out there. I know veterans do a lot of fishing, but talk to somebody who's credentialed to re represent you. Put a face to your claim versus, hey, you know, well, I'm, I'm gonna turn this in over here. I'm gonna mail it in. Then all of a sudden something happens to it and you have nobody to help you or advocate for you on your behalf if you have to appeal it. Um, that's why we're out there. So they're the subject matter experts. And there is a lot of resources on the internet. And if you're reading something off the internet, Talk to somebody who's credentialed that does the claims work. Um, don't always believe the internet because sometimes it's kind of misleading. So when you submit your evidence to support your claim for your disability, your treatment records, at all up front, if you can get it up front, the VA is very big on fully developed claims process. But if you can't do it up front, um, you have the intent to file to protect your pay date for one year. If you're shooting for an increased evaluation and you know that you have medical evidence at the VA and the VA is going to pull that, I would advise you to do that immediately so you can get the ball rolling on it. If you're shooting for an increased evaluation and you don't really have enough evidence to warrant an increase, you just want the VA to take a second look at you, um, use the intent to file to protect it and then start building some evidence because you can put in for an increase at any time, but you do stand a chance of a proposed reduction if the doc says you got better. Um, and there are certain rules, 20 years in general, the monetary rate is protected. There is another rule about the disability, 10 years in effect where the disability is protected. And both those rules cover a fraud or misrepresentation clause if they find out that um, there was an error either through fraud or misrepresentation and the VA can um, adjust the ratings of that nature. Next slide. <clears throat> so some other dis uh, disability benefits you can get if you're rated at 10% or higher for a knee condition that warrants a prosthetic device or ointments that tend to wear your clothing, you're authorized an annual clothing allowance. Is there anybody in the audience that gets a clothing allowance right now? You guys can pop it up if you do. And that's done through your prosthetic department at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, automobile allowance, those are for the catastrophically disabled veterans, amputees for loss of hand or foot. Um, they give an automobile allowance for those one-time allowance for a veteran to purchase a vehicle and accommodate one. I had a, one veteran who received one. She got a van that was customized. She was quadriplegic and um, they would put her in the van. She liked to watch TV and they paid a little bit extra, but they put a little TV in the van for her. She was in a Humvee accident on active duty. A veterans Mortgage Life, Special Adaptive Housing Grants for Veterans with Mobility Problems, and it helps you construct or modify the home to accommodate the veteran. Veterans Mortgage Life Insurance for the catastrophically disabled veterans. If something happens to the veteran, it helps with the paying off the mortgage. This is a big one for us in general. Service Disabled Veterans Life Insurance, it pays you a $10,000 whole life pro um, policy for your first original rating of 0% or higher. Generally, you have two years from the date you get your first rating 
to apply for service disabled veterans insurance. If you don't apply within two years from the date you get your first rating of 0%, you must wait till you have a separate and distinct disability rating of another condition to apply again for it. Um, so veterans will say, oh, I'll get 0% for scars. They forget about it. We get older. All of a sudden we put in for some anxiety and some other problems to get us new rating with some separate and distinct disabilities. And then they're encouraged to apply for life insurance. And uh, we never think about it, but in this business where spouses and family members come in and the veteran does leave them that small insurance policy, it's kind of a blessing because sometimes the family members are trying to pay off a house or pay a big bill. Um, and, and you should see the faces like, oh, he, he or she did leave me something behind. And then they buy additional insurance on top of that. So um, it's always amazing to see, you know, the lives change, even though they lose a person, but they still take care of them from above. And um, working with widows and family members and your county veteran service officer can help put in this application for the family member. Special monthly compensation for the loss of use of or in need of aid and attendance. So loss of use of a hand or foot, we know those are, that's a K award. Um, there is a separate and distinct disability. If you always hear veterans talking about, well, I'm gonna get aid and attendance for the housebound rate of the traumatic brain injury rate. So these are higher ratings above 100 where veterans can receive additional compensation due to the need of an attendant or housebound rate. The unique one that most veterans use is what they call special monthly compensation of Sierra. It's the S award housebound rate where they're rated at 100% for. Okay, George, are you still there? George? Uh-oh, okay. Uh, well, it looks like George may have lost his connection. So, um, while we wait for him to, to get back in, hopefully, um, I know he was about to finish up with his um, his section, um, but while we wait for him to sign back on, I just wanted to remind everyone that uh, there will be a uh, survey link that is going to be sent out soon um, through the chat. Now the survey is something that we use to uh, make these webinars better for you. Uh, so your input is valued um, and uh, you know, hopefully we could uh, continue uh, offering a product that will uh, give you the uh, information and, and services that will really benefit you here in California. So it looks like George just uh, got back on. And so while he gets his uh, mic and his video set back up, then um, we'll go ahead and let him start and, and finish us off because I think he's on his last couple slides right now. And George, whenever you're ready, just let me know and then we could go ahead and uh, continue. The uh, technical difficulties there. So, so keep in mind when you're when you're sitting there working your claims work. I mean, very important that you you talk to somebody who's credentialed to do the work, um, especially with the new Appeals and Modernization Act. I mean, back in the day, under the legacy process, we had set time limits. Like, um, so say for instance, you got a decision back, you had one year to file a notice of disagreement. Then the VA would sit on your claim for two years. Then you would get a statement of the case back and they gave you um, the remainder of the year or 60 days to get the form nine in. And then sometimes veterans would miss that time limit. Um, I had the opportunity to sit with the Board of Veterans Appeals and work this new system. Um, they came to LA and asked us a bunch of questions of, what do you think about if the veteran does this or that? So the, with the new uh, Modernization Act, it's pretty cool because everything is a year. So you get a decision back and you have the opportunity to say, you know what? I wanna take it to a higher level review at local level and I have a year to do that. Or you know what? I have new and relevant evidence to open the claim up 
and substantiate it, you can do that. Or you can say, you know what? I'm tired of dealing with this claim at the regional level. I want to take this claim straight to Washington, D.C. And everything in the timeline is one year. So I see a lot of veterans with multiple issues on claims work, especially military retirees, where I'll work a claim on retirees where there'll be like 24 issues. Um, they'll get a decision back and they'll agree with part of it. They want to take some of it to a higher level review, and then they have relevant evidence for some of the issues, and they want to take it to a supplemental claim. So this is a way that veterans can now choose a lane to what they want to do for the next actions of their claims versus going to the old standard process of veterans, you know, okay, I'm just going to wait a year and see what the VA does to it. Now, keep in mind that um, some of you may have noticed that the claims work is processing within about 90 working days. And I've noticed here in LA during COVID, I've seen some come back within about 60 working days. And that's coming through my vet reps offices. Uh, Board of Veterans Appeals uh, had a meeting and they were saying encourage veterans to do the video conference because those are coming back pretty quick. So I, they also attached a uh, 20,995 for a um, supplemental claim in the box for you guys and a 20,996 for a higher level review and a 10182 for taking your claim to the Board of Veterans Appeals. So remember the 20,995 is a supplemental claim for previously denied claims. And you, you can't, what they're saying is you can't do a supplemental claim on a decision that's based over a year old. So you have to come back with new and relevant evidence. So, um, but if you have a decision that's within a year old, you can actually take that claim to a higher level review if you believe the VA has erred in fact or law. So when you take your case to a higher level review that you just got back, the VA is gonna to wanna to know, hey, well, what facts do you believe are wrong or what law is wrong? And a lot, of, a lot of the older veterans, I know myself, I like having my say at a hearing because sometimes I may be able to interject some evidence that was overlooked. So the, the higher level review would be a course if you have evidence that shows they made a mistake. And they can, you cannot add anything if it's going to a higher level. Um, and if you write a statement to support it, just make sure there's a notation on the side where they only give you a very small box to write your little statement. Um, in the beginning of this whole process, the VA was kicking back additional documents attached to the 20,996, but um, now the Veteran Service Organization is putting statement in support of block three. You're justifying what's in error. Um, supplemental claims, uh, the standard is a little bit different. Some of us have, that have been around for a while, you look at new material evidence, the standard was way up here. Relevant evidence is something that's gonna change the outcome of the claim. So standard kind of dropped a little bit. And we've seen some of these claims come back with lay statements and affidavits that have changed the outcome of previously denied claims, which is pretty cool. We weren't seeing that in the past. We were just seeing strict denials and it would come back and we'd have to argue. Um, Board of Veterans Appeals, general rule for that, if you fill out the 10182 from the time you submit the 10182, it's one year. And then they give you another timeline if you submit additional evidence or request a hearing, they generally will add an additional two months on top of that one year. And that's in concrete. So it's telling the veteran, hey, if you do this 10182, from this point on, it's going to be one year. And veterans don't understand, well, why can't it be uh, done quicker? They can move you ahead of the docket if you have a financial hardship, severely disabled, or over the age of 75. And um, they can you know, advance the docket for you. But keep in mind, from the time you do that 101A2, it's going to be one year. So most of the vet reps are, and even CalVet, we want to always try and keep it down at the lowest level possible. If we can resolve it at regional office level or through the national queue, at the local level, it, it benefits the veteran, but there are some cases that are complicated that may have to go to the board. And if the veteran does have that option to have a hearing, um, they are doing the hearings virtually. And so hopefully, well, I have some veterans that aren't used to the computers and it's still taking me a while talking to um, screens. So I'm, I'm kind of getting used to it, um, but advise the veterans, if you have a buddy or a peer that is not techno savvy and he or she says, hey, I got this hearing 
at the Board of Veterans Appeals. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to access the internet. Kind of mentor him or her and just get the system set up. And CalVet staff is really good in Oakland and LA and San Diego at contacting the veteran. And they'll be on the screen with them. It'll be just like what we're doing through a Teams or a um, um, whatever they're using, Zoom or whatever platform they have. And the veteran, that way the veteran feels at ease. If I know in our office, if we open up after COVID, we have a big library where we can have the veteran come in and set up the meeting for that veteran. They don't have to travel all the way to Wilshire Boulevard. It takes you in LA County to go 14 miles an hour and a half. So, you know, in any way that the veteran doesn't have to um, go into the city is great. But if you can motivate or mentor him or her on how to use the system, because there's a lot of seniors that, hey, you know, might be your neighbor. Hey, I got this hearing coming up in Washington, DC, and I, I don't know how to navigate the computer. So mentor him or her, just like we did on active duty. And the hearings are coming back pretty quick and they are, um, um, the decisions are coming back pretty quick, which is really unique. So remember, you know, you're kind of veteran service officers. We're the voice of the community. We advocate for you. We're a vital part of the veterans community. And nine times out of 10, when a person comes off of active duty, they're gonna hit the county veteran service office first. If they go to the regional office, all the organizations are there. And all of us work together, no matter what organization you're from, they all collaborate together. I know in LA, they're very good. The DAV, the BFW, when they're up there, CalVet, AMVETS, American Legion, all those veterans organizations are in partnership. But the unique thing about CalVet is they have their veterans home, the fee waiver and some other benefits for you. And um, a lot of your county veteran service officers are cross accredited with DAV, VFW, American Legion, um, AMVETS, retired enlisted association. Um, and we have access to those platforms. So if you have a claim pending and you can't find one of the veterans organizations, your county veterans service office is the veterans organizations advocate in the event that you can't find them because they can help access the files and look at your case also. And uh, a lot of them and amongst veterans organizations, I started with the DAV in 95 and went to County No. 1. Uh, it's not a good practice for them to um, switch POAs. I know I don't do it because if you're with an organization, we can look at stuff differently and we can tell you, you need to stay with that organization that you started with because it's not a good practice to jump POAs. And we do have veterans that go from lawyers to DAV to VFW to county, then back to DAV, then back to... And it, it's just that they're fishing for answers and they, they're not patient. They don't want to sit and wait through the process. Um, Next slide. So in summary, you know, it, it's a lot of stuff to throw at you. Um, I like to look at it as our, our attention spans about 10% of our age and I'm 58. So if you don't get the information out to me in 5.8 minutes, you lost me. And as the claims process becomes more complicated, it's very important that you talk to somebody who's credentialed that can take a look at your documents, maybe pull up the VA system in front of you and say, hey, this is where your claims at, this is what I see. And your county veteran service officers have access to the VA systems. So um, they're able to look at your claims. So when you talk to them, they're looking at what the VA is looking at and they're able to advise you on your claims. And with that, should be the last slide. You, um, you could email me and I'll, I'll work with anybody from all over the state. I deal with people out of New York right now because I'm not sure if uh, a lot of the organizations are working cases. Um, there is a national organization, NACVSO, that does help veterans from all across the state. So if you have relatives in other areas that need help and they want to contact me, remember I'm a veteran service supervisor. So, you know, if you get me, I'll probably schedule you something out on um, in the afternoon. And uh, CalVet, they'll drop, out the, they'll drop that link in there because I'll have a full list of uh, people. Um, we're still experimenting with a wait while application, the same that the VA is using to schedule you guys for an appointment. But it's, it's very important, you know, to seek out your benefits. And if you had a previously denied claim many years ago, let somebody take a second look at it. I mean, there are different sets of eyes, have different opinions. And I'm not going to use the terminology that we use in the military. Um, opinions are like gluteus maximuses. Everybody has one. And I hope that was sensitive enough. But, you know, keep in mind that claims work is very opinionated. And um, there is a process that we must go through. And it's our right or the veteran's right to take it to the end. You, you wanna have your say, 
Um, this is the way the vet reps are taught. You, you can make an argument. If you can make a good argument and strong, your veterans reps and your veteran service organizations are out there to advocate on your behalf. A veteran should not have to pay for services. Keep that in mind. There are a lot of organizations that'll say, hey, we'll get your claim done quicker. And then all of a sudden you're signing a $5,000 contract for a financial planner. And I know some of you might've seen that. So be very careful with that. And with that, it should be about 11.15 and- Yeah, all right. Thanks, George. Appreciate that, man. Um, yeah, so the, the claims and compensation process is a complex process, which is why whenever you were, if, if anybody has ever tried to give CalVet a call, we would always recommend them speak with the CVSO. Um, and we pretty much tell them to speak with the CVSO for, for any problem, just because these processes, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't help to do it alone. And so definitely use these people when, uh, when they say that they could help you out, they're there to help you out. So now we're going to go ahead and move on to um, our questions and answers portion. Um, uh, thanks for everybody for sticking around. Um, we are a little over time. Um, so we're probably going to be doing this for maybe about another uh, 10, 15 minutes uh, at the latest. Um, and we're going to focus on more general questions than specific. So if we don't get around to your question, if you've asked one, um, you know, we apologize. We're just we're trying to save on time. But these are our email addresses right here. So if we don't get around to your question, feel free to email one of us and we could definitely uh, try to answer um, those more personal questions um, later on. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Kirk. Kirk's gonna uh, handle the questions and answers for the next uh, about 10, 15 minutes. And then, um, and then we will close it out. So go ahead, Kirk. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, we do have a lot of questions in there. And uh, just so you know, I did uh, copy and paste all of the questions from everybody in direct message to George, because all of them were pretty much focused towards you, George. So if George, if you can get a um, uh, cut and paste or get all that information from them, uh, perhaps you could reach out to each one individually. And we can go from there. Uh, the I, first, I, I can I can set them up in the remote appointment system if they're interested. So you they'll get this uh, they'll get this message um, probably tomorrow saying you have an appointment with. And so if you get this odd text message off your emails, um, um, it's coming from us. So we're experimenting with wait while, and it'll go okay. to me. <laughs> Okay, so let me go back to the questions. Um, there are some general questions. Um, uh, the first one was from Darren about what is the benefit of having the veteran classification listed on your driver's license? Um, I think uh, Michael may have already covered that one. It's, uh, it's kind of specific, but it's, uh, he mentioned it that you don't have to carry specific documents around. Um, and did you, want, did, you, did you want to elaborate on that one or move on? So yeah, I, I, I guess what I was going to say was, uh, you know, for for restaurants or movie theaters or just other places that offer like veteran discounts, you would usually have to have some kind of proof of your veteran status. And so now instead of carrying around, you know, the sensitive information on your DD form 214 or having an extra card that that represents your veteran status, you can just have that word printed on your driver's license and just carry that around and show it. And it's just as good. Okay. Oh, so, uh, Michael, and that's a, to expand on that too, is the purpose of that program was to get you in to talk to the vet rep about benefits. So, if you haven't filed a claim for compensation or fee waiver or any other of the variety of CalVet benefits or state benefits that may be available to you, that's the other advantage. But it, at least it got you to meet your county veteran service officer. And there may be that time where even if you're 100% that you need to go to the special monthly compensation of S award because the disabilities have increased in severity. So well, that's a great thing about having that thing on there. You connect it with CBSOs and Calvin. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, that's a that's an awesome um, uh, point. Thank you. Okay. The next one is uh, from Kristen. Uh, her husband's a combat vet in the Army National Reserves, uh, and he. Let's see. They live in California, and wondering if the educational benefits for his dependents transfers, even though. Uh, to California, even though he served, he was in Pennsylvania. So is, uh, if the veteran served and he's service connected at 0% and the child is a resident of California, the CalVet college tuition fee waiver applies. 
Great. So Thank they, you. They can live out of state and the kid goes to school and is a resident of California. So they get the tuition waiver for free. That's correct. Thank you. Uh, the next one from Alex, the state park pass. I am 90% honorable discharge, but served in peacetime, which made me ineligible. Can you please clarify? Uh, I thought that the, for, for the state park pass, I believe it was just an honorable discharge and a disability rating of 50% or more. And there was at one point you had to be a resident of California, but I believe after Veterans Day of this year, they changed it to where as a veteran, you're able to enter into any state park pass in the country for free. Okay, I'm not sure if it's to the state parks, but I do know that the uh, veteran status is for the national parks. Um, that's oh, correct. The, I'm sorry, the national parks. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Alex, I'm going to put the uh, wildlife website in the chat box for everybody. So I will, uh, that way you can access the information from the wildlife website. And also in your resource book, it, it does say Army Discharge War Veterans who are residents, and that's probably what he's talking about, that one word. Page, page 21 of the book that I have. Right. Okay, I'm putting this in the chat for everyone. And, and I think there's legislation that's probably gonna change that, but it's something that maybe Calvin. Okay, and then uh, the, I'm sorry, the wildlife website, it's for the hunting and fishing. I'll also put the state park license in there as well, in a, briefly. Uh, the next one is from Rick. Uh, good, he wants to thank us all for in advance. Uh, how long does it take to the VA to respond to an appeal, George? So if the appeal is going up to the Board of Veterans Appeals and you completed a 101A2, from the time you submit that form is one year. If you add additional evidence and they give you 60 days to submit additional evidence, so it's one year and two months. If you're requesting a hearing, one year and two months. And that's the approximate times that they're giving us right now. Now with COVID, it's going a lot quicker. So uh, you know, keep on top of it and get with your vet rep to check status because we can look at it in the system. Okay, thank you, George. And uh, I just did part, uh, put the parks website in uh, the chat for everyone for information on the state parks pass. Um, the next one is from Darren. Uh, he asks if he didn't go to the clinic at all in his in the service, how do you substantiate um, no medical records that you were seen for a service connected disability? So. I bet you if I got a hold of Derek's service treatment records, it's probably got an entrance exam and an exit exam. And he probably went to sick call and basic training for something or another. So any, any disease that you develop within a year from separation that becomes chronic in nature may be service connected under a presumptive period. Generally the rule is like 90 days from separation or 90 days of active duty to turn presumptive. But if you develop a disease process within a year from separation, you may be able to service connected but it's very important to get with the county vet rep to pull your service treatment records because sometimes veterans forget, oh yeah, I went in for this and they noted that I had a big one we see is like a shaving profile or um, they might've had arch supports placed in their shoes and they might've only went one time, but if they developed a process of um, an injury or disease and we can link it within a year from separation, nine times out of 10, the VA is gonna grant it. Now keep in mind that if you served in combat, there's a regulation that covers situations that um, fill in combat, uh, 3.304, 30 CFR 3.304 subsection Delta. So if, if there's combat veterans and I was an NCO, so I never went on sick call, I just sucked it up, you know, um, and my back was raided um, and I just took a lot of Moltrin and I only probably went one time and the military gave me Moltrin and um, it was granted because of um, my service and what my MOS was. So don't put it past that you may or may not get service connected. Get with the county vet rep to order your file. And once we take a look at your service treatment records, the county veteran service rep can say, hey, you know what? I see that you did go for treatment one time your first year and you just went and bought over the counter medication. But there's generally that one year period from separation to make a determination for conditions that incurred in service. Um, and you still have to build continuity statements, affidavits, and things of that nature. Case in point, one example, one individual that I work with, um, 
he got in trouble, was reduced to E4, and the sergeant took his whole medical file in front of him and threw it in the trash can and told him, I'm throwing your medical records away. This guy had 12 years in the military. And the case was one based on affidavits or te- uh, lay statements from his spouse and family members. Since he was married, for, he was still married to the same lady in the military. So the comp and pen evaluator had to make a determination on the statements and his current treatment and, and have the nexus to the service, to the affidavits, to his current treatment and granted the benefit and it was for a heart condition. And um, the best evidence was the affidavits from his spouse. Okay, thank you, George. Um, So we have uh, time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, There is a lot of questions in the chat. Um, So there's, let me, uh, from Shandi, if my claim for my back was denied, can I file for it to be secondary injury instead? Uh, I'm primarily rated for my hips. So get the nexus from your primary care doctor linking your hip and the way you amputate and then go back in with a secondary because of your gait issues is now causing lower back issues. So if the back issue isn't linked on a direct basis, you may be able to try and link it on a secondary basis. If you get your doctor to say, well, yeah, because you're locking and unlocking, now it's causing low back issues. Because it generally works in the U. Um, hip, knee, back, opposite hip, knee. Okay, um, thank you. Another one uh, quick um, if can you apply for voc rehab again if your employment status has changed and I'm found with additional disabilities such as PTSD and that is from Ed. So I, ha- I did have one of my reps when I was north apply for voc rehab when he was still working stating that his PTSD aggravated his present employment and the voc rehab would make the determination if they're going to accept you into the program. This individual did get into a computer program. So, you know, you're right to it and make the argument if they deny it. So okay. all are, are appealable. So. Thank you, George. Real quick, um, Teresa asks, uh, are any of the VSOs open? Uh, I left a voicemail, haven't received a response since 15 December. Oh, what county? Uh, they didn't specify which county. Uh, so if you, if you give them that, it, that one eight four four serve, and and I did, I posted it in the chat. So there is information for the one eight hundred four information for the serve number in the chat. And then if you can't get a hold of them, just have her shoot me an email, and I'll look at her stuff if it's available. Okay. And I will post it in the chat again. And I apologize, anyone, if we have don't have time. It's now 11.30. We've gone long. Um, can you please um, reach out to George if you have any further questions or contact us at our 800 number that's listed on the website. And you can uh, ask any questions that you have related to this information that was provided. I'm going to turn it back over to Michael, and he's going to give you some information to wrap things up. All right, so we made it to the very end. Um, and before we close it out, I wanna give a quick uh, uh, little rundown of what this slide's all about. Um, so we do have some upcoming webinars for the month of January. Um, if you look at the uh, January 8th and 14th and the 28th, you can see that those uh, webinars are hosted by uh, colleges. However, you don't have to be a student to attend these webinars. Just simply go to our registration page and register. Um, But uh, we will continue putting up uh, webinars in the future. Um, So just keep checking in with us to see what's what's upcoming. And with that being said, um, thank you for your service and thank you for attending today. For any questions um, that you have for the presenters, feel free to give us a call or email um, and we'll do our best to answer them. And again, I apologize if we didn't get around to your question today, um, but please, please use our contact information um, if if you do need our help. With that being said, you guys are all good to go. Thanks again um, and have a good day. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone.
Hey, get out there and file those claims. File those claims. Bye. And I'm stopping recording now.